This is Rating Descending. Where we watch IMDb's worst 250 so you don't have to. My name is Abigail Ward. I'm Michelle St. Clair. And tonight, we watched A Wrinkle in Time. After the disappearance of her scientist father, three peculiar beings send Meg, her brother, and her friend to space in order to find him. Let's watch. Hey, we're recording remote this week because uh, Brooke has my uh, my, uh, <clears throat> my darling girlfriend Brooke has COVID, uh, which is Whoa. which is rough. You know, I thought we we're over that. Yeah. It's a bit. What do the kids say? It's a bit chuggy. It's a bit old school. You know, a bit behind the times. Um, What's chuggy? Oh my god! It was one of those fucking things. I mostly saw it play out on TikTok, where like. Some young people said it, and then that meant that millennials got very angry that uh, Gen Z were saying it, which prompted a lot of Gen Z to say, we don't actually use that because they personally uh, weren't experiencing it. And the rule of the internet is if you personally haven't experienced it, then it is untrue of anywhere or anyone in the world, um, which then it's led... It's tough for me when you make a joke about like kids sayings and slangs and being part of it and then i have to ask you for fl- clarification on what you're talking about that is very That's chuggy, demeaning you know <laughs> it's meant to be like outdated or old that that's that's uncool man that's so 2015 you know that's ch- chuggy no one says it it's chuggy, fake it just is, makes people where, mad where, what does chuggy mean where does it come from what do you, i don't know the they're all all slang is gibberish. They're just nonsense words. No, all slang originates from something that became a nickname that became a term. Do you want to look up the etymology of chuggy? Yeah, how do you even spell it? Is it C H double O G Y? No, C H E U G Y. Chuggy. That's just more demeaning. Somehow, I feel more embarrassed. It was coined back in twenty thirteen. I man, I don't know, like. This is this is the th- whole thing about slang words and generations. We've ranted about this before. It's silly. It doesn't mean anything. What the fuck? Chuggy has a Wikipedia page. This just keeps getting more embarrassing that I've never heard this term. Yeah, see, this is what I mean. It's a word that was used by a very small group of people and then no one really used it. And then, yeah, here we go. I'm finding in this history thing, it was uh, someone on TikTok picked it up and made it go viral as like, getting mad about how people are using the word chuggy, prompting young people, which makes sense that they were like, we don't use this word because it was from 2013. Yeah. S- silliness. It's funny how it was coined in 2013, but now it's famous now because apparently it was mentioned in TikTok, yeah, in 2021, and it, ex- it inspired a bunch of people to start talking about it again, and it became the informal word of the year. Shenanigans. Silliness. Meaningless. Shenanigans. Shenanigans. We're... D- we're done with it. I hope Brooke does better with, Me too. with the COVID. We've been full on, like, masks inside. I don't want to get sick. And somehow I've managed to test, been tested negative. D- don't, know, don't know how that luck has happened. But, hey, d- there's a lot of things that can go wrong, even though I'm fully vaccinated. So, you know, pray, pray for me. That my luck holds out <laughs> until she's well. It just must be so odd having to be in a house with your partner and not being allowed to, like, touch them. You know how when your significant other or even a housemate is, like, really sick with, like, a cold or something and you go, oh, baby, and you, like, touch their forehead, maybe you kiss them sweetly on the cheek and, like, make them food. Um, what if they were instead making you food and then wearing a mask and then leaving it nearby and then <laughs> not touching you? <laughs> She's she's a monster. She's a sick monster. Yeah, she's she's. I literally have. Uh, I've got it in front of me. Uh, like my water glass has tape on it, so I know. Like this is my water glass. Everything else is hers. <laughs> you have one water glass, and she she's hoarding all the water glasses. You I deserve feel, better. I feel like it's more possible for me to put in the effort of finding my glass than than her. She can just grab whatever. <laughs> Fair enough. I know the logic Fair should be that she one. has the one glass, but. No, you're, you're doing the noble thing and giving her a plethora of glassware to choose from. Yeah. And you're just stuck to your one meager little glass. <laughs> but yeah, so hopefully, hopefully we get better and we don't have to... Rec- <laughs> These last few weeks have been... This is Rating Descending. Where we watch IMDb's Worst 250 so you don't have to. My name is Abigail Ward. I'm Michelle St. Clair. 
and tonight we watched A Wrinkle in Time. After the disappearance of her scientist father, three peculiar beings send Meg, her brother, and her friend to space in order to find him. Let's watch. Hey, we're recording remote this week because uh, Brooke has my uh, my, uh, <clears throat> my darling girlfriend Brooke has COVID, uh, which is Whoa. which is rough. You know, I thought we we're over that. Yeah. It's a bit. What do the kids say? It's a bit choogy. It's a bit old school. You know, a bit behind the times. Um, What's choogy? Oh my god! It was one of those fucking things. I mostly saw it play out on TikTok, where like. Some young people said it, and then that meant that millennials got very angry that uh, Gen Z were saying it, which prompted a lot of Gen Z to say, we don't actually use that because they personally uh, weren't experiencing it. And the rule of the internet is if you personally haven't experienced it, then it is untrue of anywhere or anyone in the world, um, which then it's led... It's tough for me when you make a joke about like kids sayings and slangs and being part of it and then i have to ask you for fl- clarification on what you're talking about that is very That's chuggy, demeaning you know <laughs> it's meant to be like outdated or old that that's that's uncool man that's so 2015 you know that's ch- chuggy no one says it it's chuggy, fake it just is, makes people where, mad where, what does chuggy mean where does it come from what do you, i don't know the, they're all all slang is gibberish. They're just nonsense words. No, all slang originates from something that became a nickname, that became a term. Do you want to look up the etymology of chuggy? Yeah, how do you even spell it? Is it C H O G Y? No, C H E U G Y. Chuggy. That's just more demeaning. Somehow I feel more embarrassed. It was okay. coined back in 2013. I man, I don't know. Like. This is this is the th- whole thing about slang words and generations. We've ranted about this before. It's silly. It doesn't mean anything. What the fuck? Chuggy has a Wikipedia page. This just keeps getting more embarrassing that I've never heard this term. Yeah, see, this is what I mean. It's a word that was used by a very small group of people and then no one really used it. And then, yeah, here we go. I'm finding in this history thing, it was uh, someone on TikTok picked it up and made it go viral as like getting mad about how people are using the word chuggy, prompting young people, which makes sense that they were like, we don't use this word because it was from 2013. Yeah. Silliness. It's funny how it was coined in 2013, but now it's famous now because apparently it was mentioned in TikTok, yeah, in 2021, and it ex- inspired a bunch of people to start talking about it again, and it became the informal word of the year. Shenanigans. Silliness. Meaninglessness. Shenanigans. Shenanigans. We're... D- we're done with it. I hope Brooke does better with, Me too. with the COVID. We've been full on, like, masks inside. I don't want to get sick. And somehow I've managed to test, being tested negative. D- don't, know, don't know how that luck has happened. But, hey, d- there's a lot of things that can go wrong, even though I'm fully vaccinated. So, you know, pray, pray for me. That my luck holds out <laughs> until she's well. It just must be so odd having to be in a house with your partner and not being allowed to, like, touch them. You know how when your significant other or even a housemate is, like, really sick with, like, a cold or something and you go, oh, baby, and you, like, touch their forehead, maybe you kiss them sweetly on the cheek and, like, make them food. Mm. What if they were instead making you food and then wearing a mask and then leaving it nearby and then <laughs> not touching you? <laughs> She's she's a monster. She's a sick monster. Yeah, she's she's. I literally have. Uh, I've got it in front of me. Uh, like my water glass has tape on it, so I know. Like this is my water glass. Everything else is hers. <laughs> you have one water glass, and she she's hoarding all the water glasses. You I deserve feel, better. I feel like it's more possible for me to put in the effort of finding my glass than than her. She can just grab whatever. <laughs> Fair enough. I know the logic Fair, should be that she one. has the one glass, but. No, you're, you're doing the noble thing and giving her a plethora of glassware to choose from. Yeah. And you're just stuck to your one meager little glass. <laughs> but yeah, so hopefully, hopefully we get better and we don't have to... Rec- <laughs> These last few weeks have been rough for our recording schedule. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of sickness. It's flu season, baby. I was, um, in, I was actually not there 
and we wanted to record, but we were sick. And then I came back and then now there is actually more sickness. We're remote, even though we're in the same city. This is silliness. Shenanigans again. COVID never sleeps. <laughs> that's that's in what they famously life, say about I, COVID. <laughs> in my life... Well, I need to like really, I need a little rant corner. My rant corner is that um, planning a wedding fucking sucks. Um, I hate it. I want to get married, but fuck weddings, man. I hate that. Like I I want a big party with all my friends and I want to feed people and, 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 and I want them to, to have a great time, but also this, the various aspects of it. And we're not even doing all the aspects of it. I just fucking me up. Like, as you are very well aware. Oh yeah. Because you take great offense to it. I'm not having like a bride's party or a groom's party because that's too much work. Well, I can't yeah, be fucked with a hen's night. Because it's going to be weird for me as the maid of honor to be standing up there without anyone else. That is that is strange. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent, Michelle. That's Michelle's why. very I'm upset. Why. <laughs> very upset that she's not going to be a, <laughs> a maid of honor. Sorry, I didn't hear the word not there. I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm not that upset that I'm going to be a maid of honor. It's going to be really great. It's going to be a great time. <laughs> In your dreams, Dal? In your bloody dream yes you're right no, it just, is a dream yes <laughs> it's just too much effort i can't be bothered with like all of the absolute shit <laughs> that goes into like choosing the right people getting them all dresses having everything coordinated having a huge luxurious ceremony like i barely want a ceremony as is. Yeah. i just want to be so quick and efficient so just like and i just want to have a good party yeah just one one bridesmaid <laughs> <laughs> Still in the bridesmaid. <laughs> still but I guess, in the bridesmaid. I guess if there's only one, it'd be the highest rank. It's basically like winning no, uh, at bridesmaids. <laughs> <laughs> You're still. We, we have an open speech policy, so you can still make a speech if you want. You know, it's. it's okay. You'll have your moment of glory because apparently this wedding is all about you. <laughs> you know, you you're the one who didn't really want to get that married for so many years of of your 20s and what now you're gonna change your mind you're not even gonna i'm gonna i'm happy getting married i just don't want the big fucking hoo-ha yeah, wedding just, so that's why you know, just a- one <laughs> <laughs> you know they do say like if you're the bridesmaid you really have to um help out with the wedding a lot and yeah help the bride uh-huh if i did make you a bridesmaid maybe i could just push all the responsibilities onto you yeah i'm really good at planning and logistics you're talking about how it's really hard to plan by yourself and you have a fame like my (laughs) job is 50 percent planning like come on (laughs) all right pitch 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 your um pitch yourself as a bridesmaid to me this is the formal interview let's go okay we open on a sunrise (laughs) fire in the distance i'm loving it i'm loving it a dragon swoops down however he is not your enemy. He, you immediately recognize him as a friend. Why, hello, Abigail. It is the day of your wedding. <laughs> um, I, I, I step down off the dragon. <laughs> I've got your dress. <laughs> Freshly pressed. I mended it. <laughs> I mended it. Freshly pressed. <laughs> And you say in a hushed whisper, don't worry, it's all under control. Don't worry, it is all under control. I, I take my the hood of my cloak <laughs> back. <laughs> so <you see. laughs> Michelle? <laughs> Michelle Sinclair, is that you? <laughs> I have seen the witch, the seer of ages. She says today is a day foretold for years. The wedding of the stars well, is... A- look, it's not a classical bridesmaid's pitch. Um, but I just we've all got to think about it yeah uh, there's a whole pr- team of producers you know right. it's not just me I wish I could but yeah you know, I've got a whole company behind me and yeah yeah board I'm, and- I'm excited to get involved in this planning and decision you're right yeah we've all got to think about <laughs> together <laughs> <laughs> We've all got to think about the next steps after you hire me as your maid of honor. <laughs> yeah. Once we're all working together, I can really help with this decision. <laughs> I will say at least I'm in the <laughs> section of my mar- of my wedding planning where I'm excited for it and I'm enjoying it. I'm almost past the stress stage because we finally have a venue locked down. But it's still like it really is so much money. Guys, take it from me. If you're that kind of person that's like you want to get married but you want to do it like secretly and privately – don't let the people around you bully you into making it bigger than it has to be because that's what I've had and it's a fucking nightmare. Do the wedding that you want. Yeah. Anyway, I hope you enjoy my wedding, Michelle. 
I'm I'm very excited for it. I'm very happy for your love. Obviously, the closer it gets to the wedding, the less I'm going to insist that I'm the maid of honor. It's only funny now because it's months away. <laughs> yeah, if I kept bringing up stresses about the wedding approaching and you kept being like, you know, because I'm the maid of honor, I'll be like, shut up, Michelle. Yeah. Shut up. No, no exactly. Smash a mirror. This right now, it's close enough to, but still far enough away. This is the Goldilocks period for this joke. we're in the prime period of this joke if i had done it months ago it would be like yeah i don't even know what's happening with the wedding you know but closer to now it's too stressful we are here it's just right this porridge tastes good and is the exact right temperature it's nice and hot it's got lots of like delicious cinnamon on top a couple of like toasted pepitas maybe even a bit of like a rhubarb coolie on Mm. the side um it's got a bit of crunch and a bit of tartness and a bit of sweetness but a honey on the side as well i do under i like i understand that if porridge is too hot that sucks and if it's too cold that's also bad but for me the main problem i have with porridge is not usually the temperature really because i find that porridge for me needs to be like scorching hot that's how i like it so so you it burns like the tip of my tongue so you're a daddy bear (laughs) i am (laughs) it's i don't like it just right i like a nice cold porridge i'm a mama bear (laughs) oh wow (laughs) (laughs) so look how big this bottle is it's It's a a very big bottle it's it's a liter you could yeah you could fill a liter of cum in there for sure well, I wouldn't say that, Michelle. <laughs> Me personally, don't think I could. <laughs> no way. As soon as I heard you register it, you went, yeah. And just put it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, there's definitely not come in there right now. No. <laughs> That'd be ridiculous. Again, once again, in a streak of mine, throwing all segues to the wind. Ooh. This week, we watched A Wrinkle in Time. Ayy. Ayy. Yeah. I didn't. I'm just going to put it on the table. Mm -hmm. I have never encountered A Wrinkle in Time. I I had never read the book, never saw Mm -hmm. an adaptation before this. Mm -hmm. So coming into it for the first time, seeing possibly the worst aspect of this story Mm -hmm. sucks. But it's made me interested in this story. And it's made me interested in potentially reading the book sometime. What's your experience with A Wrinkle in Time? Um, Well, I know... I know that Americans seem to... Tr- uh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> it, it makes me think of... Uh, I'm trying to... like Something like Blinky Bill or Play School where like a particular of generation of Americans, I think, were exposed to it. Maybe it was read in school or something. Mm. Uh, I always got it confused with a different book where someone travels to a plane where there's a naked singularity, which is like a black hole without the accretion disk and stuff. And I always thought this was, that was a wrinkle in time. And then I found out later it wasn't. And now I have no idea what that book was. So I've never, what the fuck I've never is read a it. naked singularity. I just accretion explained it. Accretion disk. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> a black hole. You know how there's the, uh, like around it for the, like the black hole. And there is uh, 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 interstellar which I'm probably going to mention again in this uh, episode, you know how there's like the thing around the black hole, like the light around the black hole that is getting sucked in. And then there's the disc around it. That's called the accretion disc. Right. Right. Without that, ostensibly you have a naked singularity. So just the dense heart of a black, of a uh, black hole. Dense heart. Yeah. It was cool. It was metal as fuck. Yeah. That's fucking metal. I wish I had a dense heart. Now I'm getting married. Jesus. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> but yeah, so, so no, I've never read A Wrinkle in Time until watching this. And to be honest, look, I thought it was pretty great. Same. Sometimes we have episodes where it's like, this is bland enough that you know that we didn't choose it for the list because why would we pick a movie like Yogi Bear for a bad movie podcast? But sometimes we have things yeah. like this. It's like, this is proof that we did not choose the list. We don't think this is yeah. a bad movie. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, it's obviously not a great movie, but it's definitely, it's flawed. I think, all I could think the whole time was if I was a kid watching this, yeah. I would love this movie so much. Oh my much. God. And I'm, I, I, I'll get to it obviously far down the track, but a lot of IMDb reviewers seem to say the same thing of this film charmed my kids and that's yeah. all I care about. And I was like, yeah. It's also like gorgeous. I'm not usually a fan of like big CG landscapes because they often don't feel integrated into reality in any way. But like, 
but it's, these are it's a kids film it's a kids thing it, they're also like very vibrant and imaginative in a way that I don't feel about other like big blockbustery like here's just a big bunch of CG mess in the distance it, it was so colorful this movie was so colorful after watching just so fucking colorful. big screen sludge for 10 years holy shit but so I colorful say, I mean like I just, I have no issue with some of the, I think that like it's a kid's film, so it doesn't yeah. have to look necessarily super realistic. I mean, we watch animated shit all the time. I watched mm. Barbie Nutcracker when I was a kid, all right? It's fucking fine. Kids like it when it doesn't necessarily look real. Yeah. They want to be transported. But just aside anything visual, right? Or any of the performances, the only thing that I found difficult about the film was just some of the plot like logic. Yeah. But even yeah. then again, it's a kid's film. They're not quite as discerning with those things. When you watch it as an adult, obviously the plot is bizarre towards the end. But I, I'm again, I think that the whole like, theme behind the movie as well and like the bit where she's talking to her brother at the end was actually kind yeah. of really touching. And I was like, no, yeah. if I was a kid, I'd be bawling my eyes out. It sucks when we have to do kids films on this list because I don't want to shit on things that kids are enjoying because they're obviously not the same as what adults watch and enjoy. It's so a, I, don't, I just don't, it doesn't feel fair to criticize it that much. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's like back in the day when people hated on Return of the Jedi for the Ewoks because they're like, it's kitty, but then kids love it. They adore it, right? Like, yeah. you know, some, some of the times we've done kids movies, I'm like, yeah, but also children still have discernment. <laughs> yeah, and don't get me wrong, kids films don't have to be bad or there's a lot of good kids films there's still a range of of quality within kids Mm. films but it just this coming up on the list as low as it is in comparison to things that we've watched doesn't feel fair like how the fuck is this lower than sex in the city (laughs) 2 this is this is lower than (laughs) this is lower than movie 43 this is lower than uh, the gallows, which was a couple weeks ago. <laughs> hey, this was this was lower than Basic Instinct Two. Yeah, <laughs> let's go straight to the top. This is lower than God's Not Dead. Like this is lower than Nothing to Lose. <laughs> One and two. Yeah. God, like God, what the fuck? <laughs> that is hardly fair. People, like, it's a Disney film as well. Disney produced yeah. it. Um, yeah, and it has a it has a really stellar cast, and the mm. person that directed it, Ava DuVernay, right? Yeah, exactly. And Ava DuVernay did Selma. Yeah, and like it was also written by Jennifer Lee, who wrote and directed Frozen. So it oh, was wow. done by really notable Disney talent and drama talent. And I feel like you can tell. People hated it because Oprah Winfrey looked like a mermaid. Like some of the costumes were a bit over the top, you know, and some of the performances weren't that great. But yeah, she's like a space deity in a kids movie. Of course, she could yeah. look ridiculous. Yeah. If they made her not played by a person so that she could look even weirder, they would have criticized that too. There's no winning. Come on. Come on! <laughs> Come on! And also the cast, the cast was great. We had Oprah oh, yeah. as Mrs. Witch. We had Reese Witherspoon as Mrs. Watson. And I have to say, it's a delight when Reese Witherspoon just shows up these days because yeah. I just feel like we don't get enough of her anymore. I know um, what you mean. Mindy Carling as Mrs. Mindy Who. Mindy yeah. Amazing. Chris Pine, obviously. Who fucking killed it, by the way. And then you've got Zach Galifianakis as Happy Medium. Yeah! yeah. Zach Galifianakis was also great. And Storm Reid, she's in Euphoria as the lead. She's... Also fucking killing it. Wait, what? No, Story sorry. Not, in Euphoria? She's not. She's not in Zendaya, Euphoria. As, isn't it? Yeah, she's the younger sister of Zendaya. I meant as the lead of this. Oh, right. I was like, she's not the lead of Euphoria. Yeah. Storm Reid, right. comma, in Euphoria, comma, as the lead. It, did, <laughs> it was like a separate. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> yeah. My problem with this podcast is that you don't write things out for me enough. We should just be showing each other written documents. Some podcasts have like a talk back show after. Let's talk about the episode. Ours will just be me explaining what I said to you. And I'm like, what the fuck is, what is it? What the heck is a naked singularity? Please explain it again. Well, I got to reset um, the countdown uh, for how many episodes it's been since you've done the bit of, he- what the, what the heck? What, no, what the I done? heck is that? <laughs> You're we a smart three days woman. without you saying what the heck <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's got an amazing cast and zach galifianakis as happy medium was genuinely really good i thought yeah. his performance was really it was like a breath of fresh air in it as well and yeah having oprah reese and mindy i only refer to them by their first names because we're in sure. that kind yeah. of terms um the three of them really played well off each other it was really nice seeing them together it almost had like hocus pocus vibes yeah like three actresses all together that you wouldn't expect but they work really well i mean 
uh, Mrs. Who's whole shtick of just talking in quotes kind of hamstrings her ability to participate in the movie. <laughs> largely. But she had, she had one or two things that made me laugh. That's, there was a bit where good. she did a quote from like Chris, Chris Tucker. I think she was just like, dang, mm. Chris Tucker, um, like American. American. Yeah. I thought that was kind of fun. That was fun. I think she made a Hamilton reference at one point as well. Maybe. Like, Miranda, American. But um, yeah, I thought it was charming. I think overall impressions, this film was charming. Very charming. The little boy who plays Charles Wallace, like at time, it's like, that's a little kid acting. But also like he gives it his fucking all. He was actually amazing. I was, he yeah. got better and better as the movie went on. And in like the actual dramatic moments at the end, he was acting his little fucking heart out. He was. I want to talk impressive. so in depth though about his name charles wallace because <laughs> i found it endlessly what? fascinating <laughs> is his name charles wallace and then a surname or is it charles wallace whatever their last name is it's charles wallace that so like right they call him by his first and middle name every time so it's meg often affectionately called meglet and charles wallace <laughs> Network. including chris pine <laughs> who hasn't seen them for years he's been missing in a folded piece of space and then he's like oh meglet oh my god and then he's like charles wallace <laughs> there you are <laughs> you don't have a fucking nickname <laughs> like, he's always charles wallace he starts the movie with the energy of a being who has been brought here from another plane he immediately i was like is he an angel is he a fake person he's insane as a character i love him but it's so strange to me that they're all like charles wallace and he's like here's my friend an extra dimensional deity and i'm like what the fuck are you talking about charles wallace just call him, He's like, Charles, there. one time. Charles Wallace Murray is the character name. Is it even a hyphen? I guess it's not a hyphen. Oh, it's not a hyphen. It's just his middle name. Yeah, this is craziness. This is craziness. Charles Wallace. I mean, it is a book from 1962. What did you expect? I, yeah, but but she has a nickname. She's Meg, which I assume is short for Megan or Megrold. Uh and they g- give her a nickname, and he's always Charles Wallace. It's like that was his full Charles name Wallace. before they adopted him, and they were like, we have to always address you by that full name because you're different. He's a child genius. What would they call him? Like, Ben? No, he's Charles Wallace, all right? Charles Wallace, yeah, but- child, child genius. That's his spin-off show. Charles Wallace, child genius. I'd watch that. I think yeah. that sounds neat. Yeah. As long as he gets to keep Michael Pena the puppet. Do you want to hear the overview? I do, Yeah. <laughs> Let's launch into it, baby. So I've already dipped into this a little bit, but just some general information. This film was made in 2018 and has 4.2 stars on IMDb, still in the 4.2s. Craziness, Um, shenanigans. It was based on the 1962 novel by Madeline Lengel. Cool. Who is an American novelist. And there was a 2003 like made-for-TV film as well. Mm. Um, apparently there's a lot of different, I found finding the budget of this film really odd because a lot of sources were conflicting, Mm. but I read that this film was one of the biggest box office bombs of all time with losses of up to $130 million. That was like the only thing I knew about this movie is that it was hyped up because it was like this big adaptation of a famous novel with Ava DuVernay at the helm. It was one of the first times that Disney had given a, a black woman that big a budget. And then it was just a huge yeah. catastrophic bomb. Yeah. Yeah. I Well, on Wikipedia, they say that the budget was between 130 to $150 million, but that doesn't Jeez. make sense because apparently the money it made was around $130. I think. Yeah. But the, it, the, the advertising. Budget, Cause I read on IMDb. Yeah. But I read on IMDb that the budget was potentially up to $250 million. If a movie hits even numbers, that is a loss because the general wisdom is whatever the movie's production budget is, that same amount is spent on marketing and finalizing right. and distribution and all yeah. of that. So yeah, if the movie's the marketing made for, was enormous. Yeah, well, that's a, so if it was made for 150, then it would have also spent another 150. That's why like John Carter as yeah. well was less than 300 million dollars, even though that wasn't close to what its budget was. Is that they'd spent so much on trying to prop it up as a tentpole? Well, there you go. It lost 130 million dollars. That is such a Fuck. substantial amount of money. Yeah. Something else that I read about this, which was cool, is that um, 
how do you say his surname? Like Raman Jawadi? It, it's so funny. I like to talk about this all the time because I always assumed his name was Raman Jawadi, right? Because I'm like, yeah. hey, my knowledge in those languages, that sounds like, right. And then I watched, remember the, the scene at the end of season six where he, there's like the green fire and she, she blows up the thing and there's like that, that well, great organ piece. I thought you didn't even piece. say Game of Thrones, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. It's not the only show he's done, Michelle. <laughs> um, I watched a video of him playing that live for an audience, uh, which was incredible. And he w- and mm. me expecting this like Arabic guy or something. He goes, "All right, hey, my name is Raymond Jowdy," and I was like, "What the oh. fuck?" I feel like I just got Raymond slapped. Jowdy. It feels yeah. very much like American whose parents are from somewhere else pronounce his name wrong, like yeah. Bashimi versus Buscemi. <laughs> you know? All right. Well, that's good to know. Well, Raymond Jowardy um, was announced as the composer for the film, replacing Johnny Greenwood, who was oh, initially wow. chosen to yeah compose and score the film. Little Radiohead touch. He's done a bunch of scores. He's he's really good. Yeah, he's really talented. Yeah. And as we know, it's got a wonderful cast of Oprah, Reese Witherspoon, Mindy Carling. You, you get it. This is my overview. And it was tough to write because there was a lot going on in this movie. Oh, oh yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> I really had to skim over some finer details because some of it didn't make sense. Meg and her gifted younger brother Charles are still struggling four years after the disappearance of their father, Alex. A stranger called Mrs. What's It visits who claims that the Tesseract, a method of space travel that their father was studying, is real. Later, Mrs. What's It, Mrs. Who and Mrs. Witch, revealing themselves as astral travellers, have come to help find Alex. The misses lead Meg, Charles, and Calvin, a boy that's crushing on Meg, to the distant planet Uriel. Also, I think Uriel is a brand of UTI medication. Oh, uh, yeah, I think um, it is too. <laughs> nope, that's Ural. That's Ural. <laughs> 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 the kids learn that their dad is trapped on Camazots, home to an evil energy known as the It, which spreads negativity throughout the universe. A seer on the planet Orion called Happy Medium helps Meg overcome her self-doubt. Meg unintentionally redirects them to Camazots and the misses depart. Meg finds where her father is imprisoned. After a tearful reunion, Charles, now possessed by the it, tries to drag them to his master. Meg confronts the it and embraces her own imperfections and uses her love for her brother to free him. Meg tests them home and her father is reunited with his family. Meg looks to the sky, thanking the missus. The end. It's a pretty good summary. I think it, it really hits the nail on the head with what is both something I really like about it and probably my biggest critique, which is that sometimes... When you blend real world science and fantastical magic and metaphor, it can get really squishy on what's happening. <laughs> it's it's yeah. fine to do that in a movie, but it can be confusing if you're also trying to la- like hang a lamppost on, mm. no, but it's science. I do love the trope of in the final act, the person that is either the biggest antagonist or ally of the main character has been corrupted by something even yeah. more evil and as they're fighting against it in their body the protagonist is just yelling emotional things at them being like yeah. i know you i know that you're stronger than this i'm sorry i should have never let you go and the person's like ah! and they're like trying to but shake out the demons love that shit that's often <laughs> what i really like about kids movies as well is i'm like yeah it's a trope and i like that trope but it is tropey but i'm like yeah but if i was eight Maybe I'd never seen that in a movie yet. Maybe this is the first time I get to see that trope. That's cool. That's, That's true. actually we great. We should continue tropes in the hope that people just haven't somehow seen it before. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that whole ending sequence for the same reason. Like, it's it's really squishy. And you're right in that a lot of it is her just yelling at him. And I also like that her yelling at him that she's going to embrace her imperfections isn't actually the thing that turns him. It's just that then she yeah. like bash, he bashes her skull in and she's unconscious and he's like, Oh fuck. Oh my <laughs> like, God. And she's I like, Charles she's Wallace. Like, I know I'm not perfect. She's like, I know, I know, I know my imperfections. I'm messy and clumsy. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think that's the imperfections that they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I just love me coming to terms with my imperfections as being like, I don't tidy enough and I do trip over a little bit. That's my biggest problem. But that's just me. I'm just a little messy and clumsy. Uh, uh. 
<laughs> I wish one time I'm going to go, eh, and then I'm going to vomit a bit in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little messy. <laughs> a little bit of vomit. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I also <laughs> vomit a, a little bit. Do you ever pretend to gag and then you actually feel like you might gag? So you stop. Yeah. Because so, sometimes what I really want to do is I do it especially for Brooke. Often I will like perform for Brooke to cheer her up. <laughs> She'll be sitting on the couch a little sad and I'll just want to do something to try and make her feel better. But I always like, I think it's funny to pretend to start vomiting. But I, I, I really want to sell it. <laughs> So I'll go in really hard with it and it's not like, I'll be like, and then I'm, I can feel myself actually coming close to throwing up and I'm like, all right, wheel it back, wheel it back, keep it in. I just, I just want the listeners to know that Michelle's form of cheering up Brooke truly is to do lots of really uncomfortably long visual gags. Like her favorite thing was to basically turn around and pretend to shovel shit out of her ass with her fingers. <laughs> she just turn around, like the over. way that you put your finger in your mouth and go like, like that, but, but with my butt. Shit out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And usually going, oh, oh, and then sometimes spi- spicing it up by adding an, oh, it hurts. Oh. I think what I loved most about it was, was Brooke complaining, like asking you to stop doing it. And I think one time I saw you in the hallway and she was getting ready to like go out and you were chatting to her and you went, all right, well, I've just got to go back and finish off the dishes. And then you just turned around and started doing it and screaming. And she was like, please stop. I'm so sick of this. <laughs> it's funny that we're in a... Uh, audio medium because so many of my real life bits are visual entirely. So visual. You have like a one minute dance to the Spanish flea where you're pretending to rip yeah. your tits off, eat them, shit them back out and put them back on. Yeah, to Spanish flea. It really is. And it's at this point, it's a full like routine. I could do it on stage. I've performed it for several groups of people. I, I, I think one of the first times Claude came over, I was like, Michelle, do the Spanish flea for Claude. <laughs> and you did. Yeah, that's right. I get so deeply embarrassed and ashamed about doing anything in my life. But if someone like goads me to do something really silly in front of like five people, I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. It's really funny. I think one of my favorite things that isn't even really a performance, but I think is a really funny visual. It's not even a gag, but something funny visually that you do is that your center of gravity is so strong that you just can't push. I can't push you over. <laughs> like you bounce back. It's almost as if you're like one of those. What do you call those big um, inflatable guys oh, at a car sale? The inflatable. Yeah. You're basically the, the, that the way. Air's if, blowing if, through them. Yeah. If you were pushed down, you'd just spring back up. It's like your legs, your feet are so <laughs> solid on the ground. There's no pushing you over. You're just stuck. You're glued. And then you rise like a vampire out of its coffin back upwards. I feel like it's, I know like half of judo. Like I know part, a lot of judo is like redirecting your weight. And when you yeah. try and push me over, I am going down with you and then just redirecting it so that you fall away. But yeah. I don't know the other half where you can then actually defend yourself (laughs) (laughs) it's just inexplicable i've definitely been like guys watch this i can't push michelle over and then i just start shoving you and you ain't going anywhere it's crazy (laughs) no i don't go i i'm not moving at all (laughs) yeah and then when you push me and brook over we're just goners we're incredibly weak yeah you know apparently claude thought i was like putting on my weakness like he when i met him he thought that i was like pretending to be as weak as i am he was actually shocked that i wasn't faking it that i was just genuinely really weak that's brutal I'm so weak that someone thought I was doing it for attention. (laughs) Oh, I'm so twee and tiny. (laughs) (laughs) But you are. (laughs) I am. I'm twee in my heart. Just just in that cold, dead heart of yours. My dense heart. (laughs) <laughs> my tense Sorry, yeah, black you, star heart hey, good hey, callback thanks so uh, much I wanted to bring up one other thing of the ending because in that ending sequence it's like they transport to what is like the center of a tree it's like dark everywhere and it's like a big dark tree and there's like these yellow starry bits everywhere and he's got these like yellow cracks on his face and stuff and I've been playing a lot of Elden Ring uh-huh. which also has a lot of tree root and gold light and star based imagery in it. And all like all I've been playing so much Elden Ring this week because Brooke has been sick and I've been like burnt out. So every moment I'm not working, I've just been like fucking trying to play Elden Ring. So ending very Elden Ring for me. Also, I've made it to the side of TikTok that is, Elden Ring is for the girls and the gays <laughs> because like I was so hesitant with things like Dark Souls for so long because it seems so mask. It's yeah. like you're a knight in the forbidden lands and get good. You have to, it's so tough and dark and grim and playing Elden Ring. Like, yeah, there's a lot that's like sad and glum, but a lot of it is also like, Hey, 
moderate kind of spoilers for Elden Ring. Uh, I'm playing like a, a fucking star wizard who is about to marry an, a cold witch and go live on the moon. I can wear like a dress and a skirt and like that is summon pretty, the moon as an queer. ally. That's definitely queer culture. Yeah. You know how many lesbians want to live on the moon? Basically yeah. all of them. Literally, I fight the queen of the moon at one point so that I can like, <laughs> her daughter proposed to me, a, a female character, by giving me a sword. That's gay, all right? <laughs> <laughs> It that is truly fem is. culture. That, that, okay, so it's good to know that Elden Ring is for the thems and femmes. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's yeah. great to know. Because at the beginning of it, I was like, man, I'm grumpy. Everything is like hard armor. And then I just found like a cool, cute dress and some spells. And I'm like, hell yeah. You, you cast spells from crystals. <laughs> that's gay. That's, that's gay. gay shit. That's, <laughs> that's gay. fem culture. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Elden Ring is fem culture. <laughs> <laughs> Queer femme culture. <laughs> when I saw this movie was doing it, I'm like, Ava DuVernay knows her audience. Sure, Elden Ring didn't come out, but, you Are know. Are you saying that essentially this film is just building a little bunch of queers? Is that what you're saying? Little queer girls? Yeah, I think that's what the ending is trying to say. Yeah, it's it's little queer girl friendly. Let me t- tell you, these are like coded spoilers for Elden Ring. Tree, not part of the queer culture of that game. Bad. Oh, oh, bad tree? Mm, bad tree. Oh well, bad stuff around the tree. It's oh hard no. to explain. Okay. It's very fiddly law. <laughs> That's I not going to do it. <laughs> I know I brought up the Northman before, but I will say with the Northman, there's a whole like symbolism scene where there's a big, bright blue, vivid tree with people hanging off of it. That was silly. That was a silly bit of the Northman. All the shots of the symbolic blue tree, that was pretty lame. All right. And it wasn't even queer. No, nah, I like it. Oh, well, I mean, why am I watching it then? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Got to stay in our little queer bubbles. <laughs> I do genuinely like this film because I do think that it had a lot of nice things to say. Like the bit where she's getting bullied by that girl and then the girl you see, she's like looking in the mirror and she is aware that like she's insecure about her body and you're like, oh my God, the bully is sad mm. too. That whole little sequence of Oprah talking about what the it does and how it manifests in the world. I was like... This is great. Like you can tell it comes from a good text yeah. and a good source because the world around it and the, the the themes and ideas in it are really strong. It It's just yeah. a little bit like off. They didn't do enough with it necessarily. But that whole segment oh, br- yeah. almost brought a tear to my eye because you just see all these yeah. different characters that are hurting on Earth and it's because of the it. The, the reunion between Storm Reed and Chris Pine is like the best performance I've seen from either of them. Holy shit. Storm they were Reed both did acting so their well. fucking heart out. She was amazing. Because oh I remember when I was doing the research, I read that she was like, she received praise for her performance. In the beginning, I was kind of like, meh. But that reunion scene, I was like, that was that was mm. a really strong performance from her. That it, was, it brought a tear to my eye. It's so genuine. It like normally scenes like that are so overblown where they're like, oh my God. But instead it was this like, <gasps> and like actual like unable to process it and he's like and- oh meglet and then he walks out and he's like charles wallace hey <laughs> yeah what's up you little <laughs> fucking freak no but like the it's you're right it was a genuine performance because they were too stunned to speak and they all they could do was like their eyes welled up and she was almost crying out mm. of frustration like you're finally here and yeah. you could tell she was really angry about everything that had happened as well not just happy she did such a good job yeah. So, so many good, good things. And by the way, how many... This was done by a female director. How many female directors does that make on our list so far? Is that the sixth female director that we've had? I think it might be, which, again, is low compared <laughs> to how many women there are to men, but yep. is high compared to how many movies are made by women. <laughs> <laughs> what does that give us as a percentage? Because how many movies have we done on the list so far? What's the number that we're up to? We're getting really close to the 100th. Um, I think we're in the 90s. At this point, 94. 94 films and six of them were female directors. That's That's, that's almost a good 6%. stat. <laughs> that's, that's not too bad. That's hey, encouraging. You know, <laughs> wow. Women can be stupid too. We're working so hard with so little. <laughs> <laughs> Six percent, actually, when we put it into perspective, that's abysmal. That's yeah, awful. It's really trash. <laughs> I don't. Well, you know what? I don't understand though, because you're right. It comes from a good text. It's clear that there's like a lot of thought put into it. It's a very squishy uh, magic system. I don't think it would pass Brandon Sanderson's Law of Magic uh, thing. Um, all of the 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 Reese Witherspoon, Mindy Kaling, Oprah. Why are they all misses? Who were they married to? Yeah. Are they married to each other? Is this? <gasps> illegal thruple from space 
Or do they all have husbands that are just uh, kept at home? No, as I think on theme, as we've just established, this film is for little queer girls. So I think they are all married to each other and they're all poly. Yeah. Just to top things off. No, that is that is exactly what it is. It is perfect. And you can absolutely tell that Oprah is a top and the other two are bottoms. <laughs> Like a hundred percent. She's giant woman. A hundred percent. Like that is absolutely the dynamic of this space thruple made of light. They all go on little dates together and they all talk about their emotions in a really mature and healthy way. And then they go to bed and they spoon. Aw, yeah. That's what happens in the world of the misses. They fuck on a bed of clouds. Jesus. <laughs> I, I like I want to keep talking about it, but I'm so distracted by I just I can't believe I forgot my favorite part of the movie, because it's one of the bits of the movie that kind of is so silly and doesn't quite work for me at all. Which is towards the end, a whole thing is that those the three misses talk about like, hey, we're recruiting warriors to fight the, the it. And no, by the way, guys, Pennywise doesn't show up. I was very disappointed. I was like, oh, I've seen this one. They all have sex in the sewer and that's how they get out of it. No, and they that, have sex on so clouds. That's a different one. That's what I just they told sex you. There's clouds in this one. It's very different. Yeah. Um, you ever get laid in the sky? No. Oh, There's nothing like it. Um, fun fact, according to my birth certificate and math, I'm a mile high, baby. You are kidding me. Nope. Uh, how would you be able to deduce that from math? Did your mom tell you or did you figure it out? Yep. Uh, my mum's very honest <laughs> as a person. You shouldn't know that. <laughs> you shouldn't have to know yeah. that. <laughs> but if I need to know it, I'm going to burden all of our listeners with it. <laughs> it's it's a it's a really it's a really solid visual image that you've got in my head right now that I did not need today. <laughs> well, if it, I do know that at least I was I'm not a mile high baby, but I was conceived in Mudgee, New South Wales, wine country. That's cool. In a, in on, on a crisp Saturday. That's all I know. That's all I got. That's actually way more detail than I know. Yeah. I just know the location. <laughs> hey, I bet you, they were miles high in the sky. I'm sure it was crisp up there as well. No, that you were actually conceived fresh. miles below mm. in hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, favorite bit of the movie. They, they talk uh, a couple of times. They're recruiting warriors. That's why they want to find Chris Pine. And then at the end, they're trying to build up to now she is a warrior. And it's like, yes, the other warriors of light who have fought the it is the implication. Number one warrior, Einstein. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Number three, warrior, Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> Famous pacifist, the warrior Mahatma Gandhi. Number four, Oscar Schindler. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's the most. Who was the second one? Wait, who was the second one? Mary Curie. Also weird. But, right. you know, coming off the back of Einstein, I'm like, they're thematically similar. They're not weird. <laughs> they're weird in the same way. <laughs> they were good friends. Marie Curie and Einstein were like buddies. And at least they're both physicists, but then Mahatma Gandhi were just completely <laughs> veering away into <laughs> political pacifism. Did she keep And then listing? going to Oscar Schindler. <laughs> she kept That's... going after that. Oh, my God. Wait, also... let me pull it up. I, I just pulled up the list. I was wrong. Oscar Schindler, number six. <laughs> number four was actually... Jane Austen. Okay. Also, Warrior of Light, <laughs> the novelist Jane Austen. Then Frida Kahlo, Oscar Schindler, Nelson Mandela, notably the first person who was given a full name up until this point. It's just last uh-huh. names. Nelson Mandela, Maya Angelou, and then Reese Witherspoon adds, and now Meg Murray. Oh my God. I thought you were going to say and Reese Witherspoon in the movie they just include. <laughs> Witherspoon. I just. Winfrey. Did Einstein help? figure out the theory of relativity and then was taken into space to fight the it or is meg the only one who actually fought the it and <laughs> most of them aren't physicists i think that what they're implying is that the reason these particular people are heroes is that all of them collaborated on figuring out a method of space travel called the tesseract austin Einstein, Curie, Oscar Schindler, Oscar's- industrialist who smuggled Jews out of. The How do you Holocaust, think he smuggled them out? Was <laughs> what do you think he was doing? Jesus, Jane Austen. Why do you think she was so progressive? Probably the person on this list who is the oldest. She was the most progressive for her time, man. In between writing Pride and Prejudice, she was also working on <laughs> discovering the. She tesseract. was just zooming <laughs> to the future and having little meetings with Einstein and Curie. <laughs> Man, shit's fucked in and 1812. unsuccessfully fighting the, the it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's like, it really blows where I'm from. She doesn't even, by the way, beat the it. 
at the end they're like you helped yeah stall it yeah they're like you yeah. helped your brother and your dad and but it's still there and did she save the world or just the immediate people she knows i think it was like the it is coming for earth right now we gotta stall it and it's like you have pu- pushed it oh god i don't it's so vague i don't know <laughs> Well, this is right off the back of a list where Einstein, Gandhi, and Jane Austen are all warriors. I don't. <laughs> let's not try and figure I out say what's that going Jane on. Jane Austen is my favorite writer. She's definitely my favorite warrior, for sure. For sure. <laughs> Do you want to hear some trivia? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> there was some really nice, interesting pieces uh, of trivia, but none interesting enough to include except these three. These three were good. Okay. In the book, Meg and her family are Caucasian, mm-hmm. and in the movie, the Murray family is multiracial. This became controversial among fans of the book and its sequels, but filmmakers believed a multiracial family would be more relevant and relatable for a contemporary audience. Yes. Chris Pine has said that the multiracial family dynamic was actually one of the aspects in the script which attracted him to the project. That's wholesome. Neat. Yeah. That is neat. Guy. And I like that. I, that was the other thing I knew about it is that it was not written as a movie where most of them are black people and then people didn't like that about this movie. Yeah, 100%. And like a bunch of – someone made a joke on IMDb being like, I see all of the negative reviews of the same kind of people that left Black Panther negative reviews. And I was like, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can imagine the kind of fucking hillbillies that got up in arms being like, not my 1962 white family novel. Like, mean, fuck off. Oh, yeah. When – like, when watching this movie, there was part of me that was like, oh, God, I know why this is on the list. Yeah. Oh, I no. remember how, like, the Annie came out where it was a young black girl playing Annie and everyone lost their shit. Yep. That was a grim time. Nothing's changed. But to, to be fair, it's not realistic. There are no young, bl- uh, poor black people. <laughs> That's right. I stumbled across a phrase today because of this movie called Afrofuturism. Have you heard oh, of it? I, yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, like have, it's yeah. just the increase of a black presence in sci-fi, which is exciting. And like it really made me think, yeah, holy shit, that's a proper new revelation mm. that we're experiencing because they were just not included from that genre for so long. And same with fantasy. And it's 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 also specifically referring to like not just more black people, but more black ideas. Because a lot mm. of the actual like uh, concepts, like take fantasy where it's so often replicating especially English, but Euro concepts of like a medieval era. Mm. So, you know, integrating more black and uh, African concepts into that rather than just Euro, but then there's also people with dark skin in it. A hundred percent. It's a a really, really cool uh, thing that's happening. Yeah. Ofra Winfrey got the role on the spot without auditioning. She was texting the director one day and the director mentioned that she was developing a new A Wrinkle in Time adaptation and asked if Oprah could work with her. And Oprah texted back, no problem. Love it. I mean, (laughs) when I saw Oprah was in this, I'm like, yeah, Oprah didn't get into an audition room for this. (laughs) They were like, we're going to get Oprah. Desperately vying for a role. Oprah doesn't, she's not desperate for anything. Oprah gets, she doesn't ask, you know? Oprah Winfrey deciding randomly to like get into a casting room for this. <laughs> there is a diagram of space time folding in the presentation that Mr. and Mrs. Murray are giving. This shows how two distant points can be brought together without having to travel the distance between them. This fold is where the wrinkle in the expression of wrinkle in time comes from. And I just thought that was nice. That was just a very clear explanation of what happened in the movie. I do think that's neat. I do, I mean, I also, during that scene, I watched this with, with Brooke. Uh, we were genuinely distant from each other and both Aww. wearing masks inside while we're watching it. But we both had a good time. And I had to pause the movie so that I could explain to her a bunch of real science. It was really great. Um, but my one complaint on the back of that is that this is barely a wrinkle in time. The wrinkle is primarily in space. <laughs> That's true. That's the true. The only time wrinkle is that Chris Pine, from his perspective, hasn't been gone for four years, but it is primarily a space-based wrinkle. That's actually such a good point. And you could argue when they come back, it's like they barely left, but also their their in-universe journey feels like it was an hour, maybe two. Yeah, and it's not like they're beating time. Like, he was gone for four years, he comes back like it's been four years still on Earth. 
It's yeah. not like he's like but, disappeared but for four he, years in a different realm and he's come back a couple of days later or vice versa. It's the other way. Well, I mean, because when they reunite, he was... Oh, but, but it's not even like... Because she was... He was like, how long have I been gone? And she was like, four years. And he was like, no, 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 no. No, my God. But also it's hard to tell like, is that because it hasn't actually been four years for him? Or is he um, just... Or he, He's been trapped in a room and it's hard to tell time passed. Yeah. Is it just that he isn't able to keep track of his days? Anyway. Yeah. Michelle, here's some reviews. No. Hey. Reviews! On Rotten Tomatoes, the film holds an approval rating of 42%. Very high and exactly on track with IMDb's score. Really. Yeah. It's like the first time they've ever really aligned. The website's critical consensus reads, A Wrinkle in Time is visually gorgeous, big-hearted, mm. and occasionally quite moving. Unfortunately, it's also wildly ambitious to a fault and often less than the sum of its classic parts. This is like the nicest review I've mm. ever read for like yeah. any of the movies we've done. And to be honest, in all of my research, a lot of critic reviews were really nice and being like, it was charming. It had a lot of things wrong with it, but it was charming. Not that bad. It's hard to hate a movie that is clearly trying so hard. Like there's nothing yeah. cynical studio about it. Yes, 100%. It's f- it is. It's big hearted. That is like the right term for yeah. this whole film. When, um, how do you say the director's name? Duvernay? Duvernay. Yeah, Duvernay. As far what- as I know. What Duvernay has delivered, this is, sorry, this is a review left by Ryan Gilby for New Statesman. What DuVernay has delivered is essentially a feature-length screensaver which operates on the assumption that cinema for children is a matter of bright colours and dippy sentiment. That was a mean review. Rude. This is another mean review from Brian Eggett for Deep Focus Review. The film's visual and tonal approach has been pushed to erratic limits, overriding and distracting from the characters at its centre, which I think is true. They are saying, like, it, mm. it got pushed to some limits that might have gotten in the way of, like, more genuine themes. I I agree that the themes were distracted from. I don't agree with his reasoning. <laughs> but I have to say, the reviews of this film were so wholesome for IMDb that hey. I just loved going through it. So I have four IMD reviews. Um, this one I thought was fucking charming, um, because it's really short and it's a 10 out of 10 review left by Oz Oz 01. The subject is great movie. And they say, y'all haters, this movie is awesome. 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 Awesomely awesomeness. Awesome. 10 out of 10. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. You're right. You're right. <laughs> this is an insane review in that, like, this person came out a changed person. This was left by Disney Dreamer 43244. Um, and the subject was beautiful and insightful adaptation. Our family loved it. 10 out of 10. In my opinion, you either de- get it or you don't. There are so many powerful and enlightening messages in this movie, but you have to be able to understand them, not only in your mind, but also in your soul. For those who rate the movie so negatively, I understand. Please don't be offended, but perhaps the messages weren't for you to comprehend at this time. We saw this on the Disney cruise and we all felt completely different when we walked out of that theatre. We purchased the DVD when it was released and we talk about the story often in our house. I feel this movie touched Aww. our family in a way that was life changing and I am extremely grateful Aww. for it. Smiley face. It's like so sweet. That's like what a lot of these comments are like. It's really, really cute. Cool. But these last two are my favourites. <laughs> this review was left by Adadare called The Wrinkle News. <laughs> 10 out of 10. <laughs> Hello, I am Holly, age six. (laughs) You guys are all wrong about this movie. It was really good. My favorite part was when Charles Wallace saluted at Calvin. My favorite character was the little brother, Charles Wallace. What was your favorite part? Go and see this movie, Scaredy Cats, 10 out of 10. (laughs) That's so sweet. That's like the best review ever. Holly, that's just so fucking cute. And then... This review was left by Facebook 46479, 10 out of 10, called I Really Like This Movie. I really like this with the song at the end. And I love the green dragon thingy that the woman changed into. And I love how she also did it. It was really cool and fun. Way better than the book. I am Zoe and I am eight. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, okay. That's sweet. It's the so many sweet kids reviews. I... 
it just made me love this film all the more that it encouraged kids to like get online with their parents and drop a review yeah it's so sweet that's really cute yeah well that was these people's these kids reviews of the film michelle what was yours Look, I mean, to start off on the on the negative, I think like when you're watching it, it you're like, oh yeah, this is a novel adaptation because there's the problem that happens in a lot of book ad- adaptations where the movie itself feels very episodic, mm. which is really hard to get around. Lord of the Rings is one of the few things I've ever seen get around feeling episodic, and it's yeah. because it's in total like twelve hours.